Thank you for the kind introduction. For those who don't know me, I grew up in Belgium in a traditional red brick house. My aunt uh, was a lace maker and I learned how to weave baskets in craft school. At a very young age, I was fascinated about how different lacing and basket weaves or brick patterns would give rise to different shapes. Bricks, like the one shown in this uh, picture here, have standard dimensions, are discrete and rigid, solid bodies that have mostly been stacked into vertical ways that have not been changed for many decades. Lace and basket weaves consist of elastic rod networks that are bent, twisted and interlaced in complex patterns, mostly for decorative shape surfaces. Today, I'm using the extraordinary mechanics found in such discrete element and elastic rod systems to create innovative structural systems for a resilient and sustainable built environment. I will talk about how we discovered, studied, designed and even built large-scale structural surfaces that can efficiently carry extreme loading, self-lock and sh elastically shift from one shape to another. To achieve this goal, I advance theoretical and computational approaches to predict and design the overall properties, stability and failure of these systems. Capturing the nonlinear behavior of these structures, especially those with complex geometries, spatially varying loading, and those undergoing large displacements or even large strains can be challenging due to the inherent computational complexity of modeling these behaviors. As co-chair of the IASS Working Group 5 on concrete roof shells, I will mostly talk about shells and grid shells, but if you're interested in my portfolio, I refer you to the abstract of this lecture in the proceedings, where I also talk about membranes. About 10 years ago, when I was working on the shape of the grid shell cupola over the courtyard of the Dutch Marine Museum, I became curious about how we harness the exceptional mechanics of structural surfaces for structural design. How could we use their geometry to further enhance their capacity, to build them without scaffolding or have them change from one stable state to another? Throughout history, we see different shaped domes popping up that are very durable and also very resilient. I have a vast collection of images of intact shells and domes in surrounding natural and built environments destroyed by extreme loading from earthquakes or tornadoes. We wanted to establish why large pan shells behave well under earthquake loading and how they can be shaped to resist this kind of loading. For example, the thin reinforced concrete shell structures designed and constructed by Felix Cadella in Mexico City in the 1950s and 60s withstood the 8.0 earthquake that shook Mexico City in 1985 without any reported damage. Taking a closer look at one of these candela shells, the Church of Our Miraculous Medal provides insights into the key parameters that affect how such a shell responds to an earthquake. Using a finite element approach, we modeled and studied the behavior of one of the thin reinforced concrete hyperbolic paraboloid shells designed by Felix Candela. We carried out response spectrum analysis linear dynamic statistical analysis method, which measures the contribution from each natural mode of vibration to indicate the likely maximum seismic response of an essentially elastic structure. The first eigenmode with a frequency of 3.09 Hertz has a modal mass contribution of 42% in the north-south direction of the church. It is noteworthy that these frequencies are high especially compared to frame structures, but they are not surprising for shell structures because the frequency is related to the stiffness and the mass. We established that the fundamental frequency of the shell is 3.0 Hz. This, is, this fundamental frequency is due to two factors. One, the shell's high geometric stiffness resulting from its anticlastic form, and two, the shell's low mass. The plot here also shows that this fundamental frequency does not come close to the peak frequency seen on the frequency spectrum for the Mexico City earthquake. Since these two frequencies are outside each other's range, resonance 
and therefore structural damage will not occur. We wanted to find out how we can design arch and shell forms that would resist earthquake loading even better. To establish the appropriate form, the equilibrium of the arch can be visualized as a truss line, a theoretical line which represents the path of the resultant of the compressive forces through the arch. Mostly stated that for a compression arch to be in equilibrium with the applied loads, there must be a line of trust that lies entirely within the thickness or the cross-section of the arch. We employed graphic statics, a graphical method to establish static equilibrium of a structure under loading, as a form-finding method to find the ideal compressed arch shape under its own loading, expressed as gravity forces, and earthquake loading, expressed as horizontal forces, initially a percentage of the gravity forces. Subsequently, we mirrored the truss line along the axis of symmetry of the original arch to obtain a second truss line to account for the other potential direction of the earthquake. The mirror truss line is then moved horizontally and the distance between the start and end points of both truss lines defines the support thickness. Each thrust line is then offset by a distance, for example, 20% of the initial catenary thickness towards the top and bottom of the initial and mirror thrust line, leading to four curves of which the outline always encompasses the initial and mirror thrust lines. Then the envelope of these four offset curves is taken. This envelope defines the new shape of the arch which is again divided in a set of voussoirs. Additionally, we carried out an extra validation of the horizontal capacity of each form find arch by performing a limit state analysis. First, we defined a failure mechanism by imposing four hinges at the intersections of the voussoirs. The voussoirs between the hinges are combined to form a segment so that the arch is divided into four segments. Next, the acceleration that is required to onset this pre-imposed mechanism is computed based on a virtual work calculation. This calculation is repeated for all possible locations of the hinges, after which the critical failure mechanism is identified as the one with the lowest onset acceleration. This is all fine for an arch. But how can we go from this 2D arch element that takes all self-weight and earthquake loading through an actual thrust to a 3D shell element that will also take all self-weight and earthquake loading through membrane action? Our new approach is simple and effective, and it is explained here in an IKEA-style diagram. By mirror imaging, offsetting and fitting a surface through the polygons we obtain a thin shell surface. Note that this surface has edge corrugations which are parallel. The result of this new approach is astounding. Compared with a realized similar thin corrugated shell constructed by Eladio Dieste with the same amount of material, the earthquake resistance of our new shape increases by as much as 79%. We refer to the realized corrugated shell by the este as the base model. In the este shell, the corrugations are mirror imaged, whereas in our models they are parallel. The structure becomes like a metamaterial, where the properties are determined by the corrugations and not by the actual material. We realized that we can use the corrugations to tune the behavior of the structure. We define the corrugation depth and the period of the corrugation. And so both these parameters are chosen by us and greatly affect the capacity and failure mechanism of the shell. We employ a nonlinear pushover analysis using Diana FE modeling to quantify the lateral capacity. Pushover is a static nonlinear analysis method where a structure is subjected to gravity loading and a monotonic displacement control lateral load pattern, which continuously increases through elastic and inelastic behavior until an ultimate condition is reached. Nonlinear softening due to the cracking of the concrete must be included due to the brittle nature of the concrete. The stiffness reduces with each loading increment. 
Hence, we use a total strain rotating crack material and a quadratic six-node triangular isoparametric curved shell element. The shell fails not due to the formation of one crack, but due to the formation of a collapse mechanism determined by crack zones. The figure shown here provides an overview of the collapse mechanisms of all five form found shapes and of the diacetate shell. All shells fail through a mechanism that is governed by four crack zones. However, the sequence and the location of the crack zones is dependent on the geometry. For example, the DST shell fails in a fa similar fashion to FF1 and model FF5 through the ABDE mechanism. FF2, FF3 and FF4 fail through the activation of crack zones A and E around the edges, but additionally through a crack zone C at the bottom surface of the mid-span, in combination with a fourth hinge at roughly the quarter span. FF5 fails through the ABDE mechanism again. The type of collapse mechanism is linked to the depth of the corrugation, where small corrugation depths at the base lead to a mechanism that involves a hinge at min span, that is indicated by hinge C, and larger corrugation depths at the base lead to the ABDE mechanism without the hinge at the mid span. The collapse mechanisms shown on the previous slide can directly be linked to the shapes of the shell. All shapes fail through a four hinge mechanism, of which two hinges are invariably hinge A, this which is the extradus on the left, and hinge E, intradus on the right. The locations of the hinges in between vary as there are three locations where the two additional crack zones form. The crack zones correspond to the areas where the shell is only singly curved and not doubly curved, like most of the shell surface. The shell is singly curved where the two funicular polygons cross, which happens three times for each form. The funicular polygons cross once on the left side, around the quarter span, and once symmetrically on the right side, with the location dependent on the corrugation depth. The other crossing of the funicular polygons is always exactly in the center of the section. Because it is known that shells will fill through a mechanism formed around these three hinges and at the two zones at the base, designers can opt to improve the shell's ductility efficiently by controlling these locations in the form finding process or by adding reinforcement if desired. In the singly curved area, a plastic hinge occurs in the concrete due to the deformation of the section due to the plastic bending. The result of these analyses show that for all five shells, the first crack in the shells start occurring at ground peak accelerations well above the base model of the ST. The shell, with the smallest periodicity and the larger corrugation depth, outperforms all other shells. The first crack appears on average at the normalized acceleration of 0.31 g, a 58% increased capacity from the DDST shell, up to a fully cracked at 79%. We all know that thin shell structures can define architectural forms and resist loads efficiently at the same time. Yet, the labor and materials involved in the installation of their formwork and shoring needs to be of a high quality and is therefore costly. Engineers, architects and other building professionals are of the opinion that this high construction cost is the main obstacle for the larger adoption in the construction industry today. Therefore, we investigate the equilibrium states of self-locking domes constructed with the cross herringbone spiraling masonry pattern to create knowledge on how to build rigid structural surfaces from bricks without the need for formwork or shoring. For example, take the unreinforced masonry dome over the cathedral of the Santa Maria del Fiore, designed and built over a period of 16 years by Filippo Brunelleschi in the 15th century in Florence, Italy. Brunelleschi was a goldsmith and a clockmaker, and he had no formal architectural or engineering training. The rumor goes that this dome was built without formwork. How could that be possible? 
The masonry had to support itself during construction. This is another incredible feat in today's terms, where 60% of the shell cost goes into the formwork and shoring. Unfortunately, we have no detailed records of how Brunelleschi constructed this masonry dome. What we can observe from these drawings is that Brunelleschi lays the bricks in a herringbone pattern which spiral to the top of the dome. We investigate the statics behind the masonry herringbone patterns used in the Italian Renaissance to achieve self-balancing domes during all phases of construction. The cross herringbone spiraling technique permits to achieve a self-balanced state in the shells only by building through complete horizontal courses, that is, the courses at the lower levels must be complete. Also, the radial symmetry of these structures constitutes a sufficient condition for achieving a self-balanced state. Once it is closed, it can withstand compressive forces and prevents sliding. At the limit course, the friction forces between the bricks are not sufficient enough to avoid slippage. At the limit course, the bricks slide towards the centroid of the dome. However, the presence of the herringbone bricks in the spiraling pattern prevents them from slipping inwards. When the bricks of the limit course try to slip, they collide against the herringbone bricks, which are already laid in a radial manner and are fixed in, the, in a lower course. This lower brick course is closed and the herringbone bricks at that course are fixed into another lower brick course so that no sliding of the herringbone bricks can occur. Further, even if the bricks of the lower course try to slide, the same mechanism will take place in the previous course. We verified the local plate bond action using a discrete element modeling software for different values of friction of the mortar. The influence of the friction angle has been detected evaluating a variety of values ranging from 0 to 90 degrees for each laying plane. The results show that the stability of the plate bonds is indeed related to the friction angle and also to the angle of the inclination of the laying plane. In particular, as reported in these figures on the right, if the friction angle is equal or larger than 10 degrees, the plate bond structures are stable and will self-lock under gravity. The disruptive potential of this historic masonry pattern comes to the fore for today's construction industry when this technology is viewed in the context of other emerging innovations such as novel structural form-finding approaches and robotic construction technologies. For example, we imagined and realized how masonry surfaces could be tailored in their shape through form-finding approaches and patterned with the herringbone pattern to be effectively manufactured using aerial drones or collaborating robots without false work and yet be stable during all phases of construction and during their service life. I will show you next how we realized a medium span brick vault with no scaffolding or shore work solely relying on collaborating robots and humans.
I have discussed our work on discrete element assemblies. To close, I would like to show our latest work that is based on lace and basket weaves. In mechanics, large deformations can occur at both the material and structural scales. In the past, structural engineering has eschewed large deformations, implicating them as the cause of several disastrous failures of rigid structures. However, attention is now turning to how to take advantage of large deformations. Therefore, we propose to investigate two-dimensional interlaced networks of elastic rods and deliberately drive them into the large deformation realm to create novel, three-dimensional, elastic and reversible structures with interesting mechanical properties. The core concept is that the interlaced continuous rods will bend, twist and slide with respect to each other, forcing the two-dimensional network into three dimensions in order to minimize the network's strain energy. Inspired by traditional bobbin lace pattern, the torsion ground, we distilled a basic unit and called it the bigon. A bigon is made of two strips that are connected to each other at the ends through a fixed angle gamma, such that the two strips share a surface normal at the connection. Each strip has a length L, a width W, and a thickness T. Because the width W is larger than the thickness T, the in-plane bending stiffness I1 is larger than the out-of-plane bending stiffness I2. Here, the in-plane bending stiffness I1 is associated with the plane curvature that generates this arc. In other words, in this plane configuration, the strips feel very uncomfortable and could buckle out of plane to bend in the easy direction. We find that with a small w over t and a small intersection angle gamma, the bigon stains planar as two circular arcs. However, if we increase either the ratio w over t or increase the intersection angle, the system buckles out of plane. Here a bigon can buckle either upward or downward, resulting in a pair of buckled shapes. So a buckled bigon is bistable. Another structure that we are interested in is this bigon ring. Basically, we connect a bunch of bistable bigon cells to form a loop. Because each bigon cell could be bistable, we find that a bigon ring has interesting multistable behaviors. For example, we can vary the bending directions of each cell to get different shapes. We call the first one IIIIIII with all the six cells bending inward. The second one we call IIIII0, with one cell bending outward. The third one is I0I0I0, because, because the cells are bending inward and outward in alternating ways. These are the stable equilibria of a six bigon ring we found both in experiments and numerical simulations based on a Kirchhoff rod model. We have classified these shapes into three families. One, the first family is what we call the IOS pattern. Basically, it's a combination of inward and outward bending cells and the second mode of a bigon, which looks like an S shape. Second, the second family is the multiple covered loop. The third family is what we call the twisting shapes that are obtained by twisting a certain number of bigon cells out of plane. We have also looked how to go from bigons to rings to surfaces. Each fundamental cell shown inside the green and red box contains two bigons. Each cell can pop either upward or downward, covering a surface with tunable geometries. On the right is the same structure, with all the cells facing in the same direction. If successful, the theories and insights found in this project will have applications for structures and materials with reversible functionalities, such as emergency shelters and adaptive medical prosthetics like heart stents. My research goal is to harness the exceptional mechanical behavior of slender structural surfaces. Through these examples, I hope I've been able to show how slender structural surfaces can be designed to have enhanced load-bearing capacity, cell flock, and chain shape. I also hope 
that have been able to demonstrate that we can look at the past, art or craft to discover structural surfaces that have applications at the architectural and structural scale. Thank you for your attention. I would be happy to answer any questions and I wish you an inspiring conference.